Hello everybody, welcome back to CastPod. CastPod Conspiracy specifically. Ooh, because it's spooky month, I think, when this comes out, probably. Um, we're making a comeback. I think we've only ever done one episode of CastPod Conspiracy, which was the moon episode, and then the moon. And I had a lot of fun doing that. And I'm excited to bring this series back. Today, I am here with... A new addition to the Caspod team, Tom. That's me. That's him. Hello. Yeah, we fired Kevin. He's never coming back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and or is that just a conspiracy? A Caspod conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, because you know, Carter and Kevin are having their own series going that's doing pretty well. Uh, talking football. But I want to show them that, you know what the people really love? What the children love other than the books? Conspiracies. So. Yeah, I will say that if you're trying to outpace the football season talk, that this is probably the most niche topic we have chosen. Exactly. But and it's October, and it's spooky season, so hopefully that... That's uh, what I'm thinking. It's seasonal. Pushes, pushes the algorithm. Mm-hmm. And yeah... Uh, so today we're going to be talking about something, you know, when it comes to conspiracies, obviously, uh, people think about all the political stuff that's going on and like, you know, the stuff that makes people mad, but let's talk about something that doesn't make a lot of people net mad and something that I care a lot about, which are cryptids, specifically cryptids from our new D and D series on Caspod. Caspod D and D has started a spooky month D and D campaign led by Kevin, including the rest of the team, me and Tom and Carter, where we're all various cryptid creatures, uh, doing D and D things. So, we wanted to go over our characters that we're playing, what they're based on, and then if you want now with this information, go watch those videos. Plug, 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 plug all the series, all the cast pods. Um, but yeah, I think it would be cool, and it just gives some background for people who may be interested in seeing the D&D series, but don't really know like what the references are for, and so I think I'll hand it over to Tom to go over our first one, his character, which is Siren Head. Whoa, yes. So my character in the D&D campaign, uh, spoiler alert, is named DJ Siren Head. So my character's whole bit is that he is um, a very non-serious version of a serious monster which i will go over now so siren head is a cryptid that was made up by a canadian artist a canadian horror artist um a few years ago i'm trying to find i'm in the wiki right now let's see when he was actually created um it was 2018 2018 okay uh so it was very recent um, but, you know, if you're watching CastPod, you may have seen some of the memes about Siren Head before. Um, there's all these, like, kind of Slenderman-esque videos online of people saying they saw Siren Head. It's really just CGI effects, but uh, Siren Head is a 12-meter tall uh, creature that kind of looks like an emaciated skeleton. Um, and his head is a pole with different um, sirens on it. Like, like as you would see like an air raid siren um, but the air raid siren have, have teeth in them um, so those are like his mouths he doesn't have any eyes or nose or anything like that and he has these really long spindly arms um, so his whole deal is that he can replicate sounds to make it sound like you know people are calling for help or that there's an emergency siren going off or uh that there's an animal nearby or, or something to lure in people to eat. So a lot of the mythology has him being in the woods or in fields pretending to be a telephone wire and then like, or like a, like a regular stand in next to trees and he like shows up, you know, um, he, there was actually a, a fan film made about him. Um, I think it's on Netflix. No, I'm not sure. Um, but let me see here. Oh no, never mind. It's a YouTube movie, so you know it's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a horror short film about him. But it's on IMDb, so it's got 
It's got an 8.3 on IMDb, actually, which is crazy. That's really um, surprising. But yeah, so this guy, uh, Trevor Henderson, the artist who created him, uh, has done a lot of other kind of uh, cryptids uh, that are obviously not real, but just are in a different vein than something like Bigfoot, which is like supposedly been seen by people and is just sort of an internet monster. Um, so the, the Trevor Henderson guy also did uh, the Country Road Creeper. Um, he's done um, like some like a uh, myriad of like humanoid monsters. I think he's done some SCP stuff as well for those of you in the SCP community. Um, Love, yeah. Is. Love some SCP stuff. So for those who don't know, SCPs are kind of like these monsters um, that all have different names. Uh, and it's it's basically like this made up uh, internet archive of all these top secret monsters like the government's supposed to, supposedly hiding from us. So it could be like, it'll be like SCP-056, and 056 is a monster that if you don't look at it, it walks towards you, but if you look at it, it does. Or 075 could be like a mole that lives in attics, and he only moves around when like he hears, you know, the ice cream truck. Or it's, it's crazy, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all stuff that people make up, but... Um, so yeah, the made up, the Siren Head, getting back to him, he's a made up monster. Um, and yeah, so his main attribute is that he plays music or plays sounds that he's heard as an attempt to lure and prey. So my whole shtick with my character, DJ Siren Head, is that he's a member in my head canon. He's a member of the Siren Head species. Now, according to the wiki article, um, there are cave paintings of Siren Head that date back 40,000 years, um, which is interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's just always but, been sirens. That's how they were invented, um, is they saw them and they're like, we should get that. Photographic memory as a power. I don't know how. The virus is brain. I want to know how um, they figured that out. So do I. Because, like, this is obviously, this, this wiki article is um, the Trevor Henderson wiki. So the wiki is named after the artist. So yeah. I don't know if it's a fandom site. So I assume it's not written by him. Probably but, not. Siren Head is, like, probably his most famous monster. I yeah, think. I, I would assume. But, yeah, so, so, my bit on the character is taking this super serious, like, almost uh, Lovecraftian monster and saying, like, okay, what if he was just, like, a degenerate DJ? <laughs> so, in my head canon, DJ Siren Head is a member of his species that does not, who that eats people... But does not take it super seriously, and he's just more in it for the party. So all of his different, my characters, all of his different sirens have a different, like, radio station playing. So we got, like, the country head, we got the, the rock and roll head, or we got, like, the, the soul head, you know, whatever it is. Um, so he just, like, does stereotypical, like, DJ stuff, like air horns. He has a um, sort of, like, a, an arm uh, turn style on his arm that he can like scratch the record with he has a big bass boosting speaker out of his chest so it's just a total you know crap shoot of what the actual character is based off of but <laughs> he's tall and lanky and I, I honestly figured it out like when we started when we started the recording of who our characters were I was like this is who it is because I saw a meme on twitter of Siren Hen and I'm like this has got to be it that's called improv so, baby that's called improv. <laughs> don't tell Carter I said that because I don't want to be known as the improv guy. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, so looking at the just some fun facts before we move on to the next guy, uh, seems that according to this, first sighting of Siren Head occurred in 1966 with a family on vacation in the Arizona desert where they uh, captured an image of Siren Head. Um, I've seen this image before. It's, it's basically... Um, a field and it's like there's telephone wires on the side of the room and then he's just like walking in the middle of the field um mm. but yeah so it's 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 very he's slow but he's he's creepy um but yeah and apparently he has audio kinesis is the term they give for his ability to play sounds to or people in apparently he can also play them loud enough to cause brain damage Oh. Which I did not know. Brain damage. I'm learning so much about this character just by looking at the the, the summary on the wiki. Um, but 
Yeah, and it's funny, actually, uh, spoiler alert, but if you watch the D&D campaign, uh, there's a lot of dimensional travel, and apparently that's one of his powers. So. There you um, go. And obviously, if you listen to the D&D, he's a bard, because why wouldn't he be? Mm-hmm. So it just makes sense. now I'm going to throw it over to Callum to explain his character, uh, who I am not even going to try to <laughs> say, because... Callum was trying to spell it for me before the recording, and I still don't know how it's spelled or how it's said. So yeah, that's fine. Take it away. That's why he's my character. So for my character in the D&D campaign, uh, he's based on the Mokele Mbebe, which for those of you wondering at home, if you want to look it up, it's M-O-K-E-L-E hyphen M-B-E-M-B-E. Um, it is a Lingala word. That means one who stops the flow of rivers. And so basically, if you want a picture of what this thing is, just imagine like a brachiosaurus, like a long-necked sauropod dinosaur. Um, that's all it really is. And it's supposed to live in the Congo River Basin in Central Africa. And so there's like a long history of native people talking about this legend of the Mokele and Bebe. Uh, my character specifically is just named Mokele and Bebe, and he looks just like it. The whole history is the same, being from the same area. Um, but his shtick is that he is a dinosaur from back when dinosaurs were around. And he was one of the only ones to survive the extinction um, 65 million years ago. There's 66 million years ago with the asteroid. And he thinks that he survived because he had some like grand divine purpose. Like he was spared by some god. And so he's a cleric. And uh, he's very religious. He's very quiet. He sounds like Winnie the Pooh. Um... And yeah, that's his, that's his whole thing. Uh, he's a lot of fun to play. He's definitely a support character. Um, but I like him a lot. He's very different from the usual kind of D&D characters I picked. But a little more story on the actual creature. Um, so like I said, there have been stories about this thing for a long, long time dating back to like early 1900s even late 1800s people have been talking about some kind of large uh, smooth skinned creature living in the rivers and the swamps with a very long neck and they also talk about it having a large tooth or like a horn um, and a long tail so what's interesting about it is most of the stories that we get are obviously from, uh, like, colonialists and, you know, Europeans and Americans going into Africa and, like, just kind of interviewing local people and trying to search for this thing. And it's interesting in its history. Um, well, first I wanted to say that the first report of the Mokele Mbebe comes from a German captain, Ludwig Freihaus von Stein zu Lausnitz, uh, in a book called The Lungfish and the Unicorn in 1940. Um, but basically what happened with this thing is there was this tale, obviously from the local people, that kept getting shared around to the uh, white people that would then take that home and talk about it. And... What the Wikipedia page basically says is that uh, Americans and European people kind of morphed this legend so that it would look like a dinosaur. Like the original idea, a lot of people think that it's actually just based on the black rhinoceros, which is a real animal. Uh, it's currently critically endangered, but is... Uh, you know, it used to be fairly widespread. It just didn't make its way into these areas where the Mokele and Bebe is supposedly found. And so people kind of assumed that the, these local people were seeing that rhinoceros and being like, well, that's something I've never seen in my life before, so it's got to be a mythical thing. But because of the way they described it, with the horn, and I don't know where the long neck thing came from, but like smooth skin... 
um, stuff like that, people were like, well, that sounds like a dinosaur. Because around that same time, dinosaurs are becoming more and more popular in, like, just uh, to average people. Like, in pop culture, people were more interested in dinosaurs. Um, so they were just kind of like, well, yeah, it's got to be a dinosaur. And there's just, like, a long history of people going into those areas and saying that they saw something or, like, they would point to, they would show people pictures of various animals in these areas, the local people, and whenever they would get to, like, the page with a brontosaurus on it, they'd be like, that's it, that's the one. Um, and so that's kind of how the, the story has spread and how it's become more famous. But honestly, like, there's so many options that it could be. Like we said, the rhinoceros is a good option. Elephants also make a lot of sense, especially if you have an elephant swimming in a river, it's going to have its trunk poking up out of the water for it to breathe. And it's like, well, what does that look like? You know, a large, smooth-skinned animal with a long something sticking out of the water. Mm. Easy to mess up. Um, but you would think local people will probably know what an elephant is and what it looks like. Um, interesting... I those colonists wouldn't. Yeah, the colonists would be like, oh, it's a uh, dragon. It's one of those terrible <laughs> <laughs> Oh, heavens. Um, but yeah, people would say that it would, like, attack boats, but it would never eat the bodies. It only ever ate plants, and some people said it ate, like, a specific type of plant. Um, and they would find tracks and stuff, but, like, there was, there's never been any really concrete evidence there have been pictures supposedly taken of it, but a lot of them look like logs in a river. Um, and it's interesting also because a lot of, like, the searching for this thing and, like, the support for its existence uh, apparently has been pushed by young Earth creationists, um, which also... I didn't even know about it initially, but makes my character even better for the D&D campaign being very religious. Um, because young Earth creationists obviously think that the Earth, maybe we'll talk about that someday if we want to get really political, think that the <laughs> Earth, you know, is only like... You're going into dangerous territory. <laughs> hey, that's what we do on this show. We're dangerous, we're edgy. Um, but they think that the Earth is like 6,000 years old, and how do you prove you know that dinosaurs weren't around back in the day and aren't millions of years old well if we have dinosaurs here today then what do you know maybe the earth really is young yeah like you just you just don't know how to age rocks stupid um and then there's also this interesting thing that uh this one this one historian said that the Mokeli and Bebe myth grows out of earlier pseudo-historical claims about Great Zimbabwe, which is apparently this, like, ancient city in Zimbabwe that people think was, like, the capital of this, like, huge advanced nation uh, that was destroyed. Um, and is Actually. that... Sorry yeah. to cut you off. But no, go for it. I read about Great Zimbabwe in archaeology class. Um, oh, really? Well, tell me about it. Yes. So basically, the in the context of the paper, it was like they have all this archaeological evidence that existed, but like white um, researchers at the time were like, "There's no way that you know these savages could have built this." So like there was this, this these claims about it being like alien technology or ancient gods or whatever, but it's really just that Great Zimbabwe was like that's just how advanced people in Zimbabwe were. Um, mm. So it has a lot of like racial kind of undertones. And yeah, a lot of those again, going back to that colonial kind of mindset when it comes to this to this creature. Yeah, a lot of those. Uh ancient civilizations tend to be that is like white supremacist people being like oh there are actually these great nations advanced nations back in the day that taught 
the not white people how to make pyramids and stuff um but again that could be another episode uh but yeah it comes from apparently pseudo historical claims about great zimbabwe and in turn influenced the later reptilian conspiracy theory which is absolutely something we're going to talk about someday i was gonna say we gotta talk about that yeah that's gonna happen for sure um Mark zuckerberg it's only safe for so long exactly uh, but yeah, I think this creature's cool, and I think it's just interesting how many different stories there are about dinosaurs existing into the modern day. I think the Mokelium baby is like the most famous example of that, but you also get things like this one I looked up, just I only just found, called the Imbilu Imbilu Imbilu. There's no way. <laughs> this is, no is way. actually... M B I E L U, but three times. Um, which is like, like a Stegosaurus that's found in the like the Republic of Congo. There's the a lot of dinosaurs in the Congo apparently. It, it's something about Africa. People, it's like see animals and they're like, yeah, that's that's a dinosaur. Um, well, that's that's like. It's so funny because you're looking. I'm looking at the same Wikipedia page that you are mm-hmm. about this thing, and we already heard your voice for it a little bit. But the the drawing they have looks like it's drawn out of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and I think yeah. it's so funny because you're like, "Oh, yes, it's me." Or I can't do the voice, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah. And then going down, uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about this. Apparently, this thing is in Godzilla, which I did not. Yeah, know. I, I was going to mention that. Hmm. But apparently in the 2019 Get to Looking at the Monsters movie, which happens to be my favorite one, there's when they when King Ghidorah uh, releases all like the, the monsters, apparently on one of the screens you can see a misty containment area where the and it's labeled him Bele Umbebe or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, or Mokele Umbebe, so I guess he's like a real thing. And he was also in Metal Gear Solid? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's also on the Joe Rogan podcast, so yeah, know, he's credibility famous. where credibility is due. You want to talk about conspiracy? Oh uh, yeah, well, we will rival the Joe Rogan experience. Don't worry, one day we'll have Joe Rogan on the show. <laughs> Would you settle for Joe O'Neill? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll take him. Um, yeah. So there's that thing. There's the. Inguma Monene, which is like a big lizard thing, the Kasai Rex, uh, which uh, all of these Central African dinosaurs, apparently. Um, the Ropin, which is like this big pterodactyl looking thing. Um, oh, yeah, you, you taught me about the Ropin. Like, that was going to be one of your other characters, right? Yeah, that was one I was thinking of doing as well. That's from like New Guinea, that's just like a pterodactyl. Um, and also, some argue that Carter's D&D character is a big old dinosaur. Girl, we should get to that. But first, I do want to specify, because I was, it was driving me nuts until I realized why you didn't mention it. Mm. Um, you said the Embellium, the Mokelium Bebe is the most famous dinosaur, and I'm like, what about Nessie? But, plesiosaurs are not dinosaurs. Mm, so exactly. That's why, They're so reptiles. like, when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about, Nessie or the lesser known uh, Champ from Lake Champ, uh, those are those would be lizards. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would not be. And you know, there's a, there's an argument to be made about Ro- Ropin because Ropin is a pteranodon, which that's true. That is also a reptile. Labeled not a that's not a dinosaur either, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. But anyway, we're talking about big flying things, and if we're talking about big flying things, we have to go to the Thunderbird. We do. That is Carter's character, the Thunderbird, which is... Well, it's a Thunderbird mixed with the Phantom of the Opera, but I don't know if we really need to go over what the Phantom of the Opera is. I think everybody kind of knows that. Yeah, tune in for Carter Explains Musicals to know more about that. But yeah, it's a Thunderbird, Phantom of the Opera. All the plugs. Um, Yeah, so this is probably the most famous of the three. I don't think there's much arguing that most people would would know what a thunderbird is just from just from hearing it but uh to go over i guess 
because you can see Carter's character in the thing, um, in our in our D and D show, that it is a lot of fun. But to go over just the history of the Thunderbird itself, like I said, most people probably know, but this is uh, a Native American myth, specifically a lot on like the Pacific Northwest and the coast, as well as like around the Great Lakes, but really kind of all over the U.S. There have been stories from various Native American tribes about the Thunderbird, which is what it sounds like, a giant bird that causes thunder when it flaps its wings and lightning comes out of its eyes and super cool it's true Mm -hmm. and it also the namesake to a i don't know if it's still up or not but it's a wooden roller coaster at hershey park it's true (laughs) the thunderbird one of my personal favorites Uh, i hope it's still around yes so this this creature i first learned about it watching monster quest which was one of me and callum's uh childhood shows oh, not yeah. that we knew each other when we not that we knew each other when we were kids but we both kind of i think one of the first things that we ever talked about when we met was monster quest yeah classic um, show classic but it was basically like this show where they would go over one cryptid a week and the thunderbird was one of my favorite episodes because they had this hilarious reenactment where they just had a drone camera like chase this kid <laughs> and then like pretend that the kid got picked up but like cut off so it just looks like the drone like knocks him over um but yeah so it's this it's a giant legendary creature um from the indigenous peoples of north america um i don't i don't know if it's also in canada mythology. i think so um because it says it's from uh that a uh, big portion of it is from the algonquin myths and they get up mm, into true. canada that's true so yeah, I believe yeah, it. in eastern canada northeastern united states and iroquois peoples mm. um so yeah so there's this, this idea that he controls the um upper world in algonquin mythology the mm-hmm. who controls the upper world and then the great horned serpent um or the underwater panther, which I definitely want to know about. Yeah, I hadn't uh, heard about that before reading, and then I governors. saw that, and I was like, that's I've heard sick. of the great horned serpent, but the underwater panther sounds hilarious. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, so the different tribes had different versions. So that was the Algonquin. Um, then we have the Ojibwe, uh, which states that they were created by um, Nana Bozho to fight underwater spirits. So I guess that's there's that similarity with the under- underwater. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... The Men- Menom- sorry, I'm gonna butcher this. Menomini of Wisconsin tells that the great mountain that floats in the western sky, and where the Thunderbirds live. So like, there's this floating island. Um, and it goes on like there's a whole bunch of different uh, like, a whole bunch of different um, mythologies depending on the tribe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so sorry, I'm just I'm passing the icon that Carter definitely took to use for his icon oh yeah um (laughs) but so yeah it's it's like again we're we're seeing some interesting uh takes here in in modern day in pop culture um apparently there's a ford thunderbird like a truck yeah i did Mm -hmm. not know that existed um for all you pokemon nerds out there pokemon the pokemon zapdos is based off of the thunderbird which is pretty cool i didn't even think about Um, that before this moment i didn't think of it either i was just like oh it must just be thunder fire ice like that's yeah it's just like birds and i was like oh island but it makes sense because it's a floating island Mm, yeah um apparently the thunderbird is in fantastic beast somewhere to find them which i definitely remember watching that movie but i did not see it i don't remember it being um, but yeah i have seen it and then of course we have the thunderbirds being used as sports teams because all birds are sports teams we know this this is true and um, fun fact is not on here there is a depiction of it on the mountains in el paso texas really yeah there's Local just like this for you from Texas resident Callum. There's this big, just like portion of the mountain that's just like this kind of red outline. It's in like a vague bird shape. And it's called the, mm-hmm. the Thunderbird. Yeah, apparently there's also uh, carved ones in sandstone in uh, Wisconsin. Like Ooh, that's cool. 
But uh, some more gaming things. Apparently, this was it's the name of an operator in Rainbow Six Siege and was the Thunderbird was the second to last boss in Zelda 2 Link's Adventure. Mm. Which I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. Um, and then... But yeah, so this is... You see, like, you know, t totem... Uh, totem poles depicting Thunderbirds and stuff. But... Oh, yeah, I'm sure everyone's probably seen that at some point. Because uh, it's just... It's so well-known as, like, mm -hmm. one of the classic American mythologies. Um, and again, in more modern stuff, like I said, some people think that the Thunderbird could be based on uh, if indigenous people found fossils of, like, pterosaurs. And I thought, well, there you go. Mm. There's got to be a giant bird. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Um, but some people think, yeah, maybe not. Um, although there was an interesting story from the, from the cryptid Wikipedia of apparently some guy's in the like yeah in the 1800s two arizona cowboys said that they shot a giant bird but they said that it didn't have any feathers and its head looked like that of an alligator um <laughs> i've never heard that it's i i don't see i mean there's no references or anything for this so somebody could have just, just made it up yeah but... my two uncles they live in hell they live in arizona <laughs> they think they killed the thunderbird exactly um which is just, like, a, a crazy story to tell. But, yeah, apparently, like, that obviously is more closely to, like, a, a a pterodactyl or a pterosaur of some kind. But most depictions, I think, from Native Americans really do depict it as a bird. Like, you can very clearly see, like, the wings with feathers and, like, a kind of triangular tail and definitely, like, a curved beak um so very uh eagle like or hawk like yeah definitely and so that's why other people think that maybe if we're trying to relate this to like a real thing but still be an extinct thing because we have to add some incredulity to it uh it could be a teratorn which is a genus of bird of ancient bird from the americas specifically something like argentavis which is one of the biggest birds, flying birds, to have ever existed, if not the biggest. Um, I think it's Argentavis magnificens is the main one. And some people estimated that its wingspan could be up to 26 feet. Um, Gosh, dang, dude. But more... Bigger than some pterosaurs. I mean, it's massive to think about. Uh, but more, Some more modern interpretations think it's more closely between, like, 16 to 21 which is still insane because mm -hmm. if we think about modern birds like the california condor its wingspan is more like nine feet or something uh right, and then like a 9.5 or something which is it is the largest wingspan of birds today it's insane um but you know some people think maybe that maybe it's this ancient bird that used to live because it did live in the americas the territories um, but also, I think, very clearly could just have been a big bird, like, not Sesame Street, He's but like, <laughs> like, if this is coming from, you know, the Pacific coast, mainly, like, that's where the condors are, and turkey vultures as well are True. massive birds when you see them up close. You don't really notice it when they're like way up in the sky circling around but if you ever get close to a turkey vulture like those things are big yeah and i and even, even like there's some other not that they would be in america but there are some other vulture species that are really big like king vultures oh yeah and um, that story creatures. from monster quest where they talked about that kid being picked up by giant birds that they thought were thunderbirds they mentioned it having like a, a white ring of feathers around its neck which is much closer to like a couple of vulture species or condors mm -hmm. um right but yeah i think i remember specifically seeing those monster quest episodes and then the next time i would see like 
turkey vultures like up close i'm like that's it that's a thunderbird <laughs> oh my god they're here for me they're here they knew it uh um, take me to their leader because when you're a child and you see a bird with like a five foot to six foot wingspan yeah you'll probably you know uh exaggerate and especially your memories are going to warp it and think like yeah that was probably like a good 10 12 feet across probably could have caused yeah, thunder if it wanted to yeah i survived a pterodactyl <laughs> also uh, like there is something to say about when you're a kid like i know that i didn't know that birds had like hollow bones until i was in, like middle school yeah when i was like a little kid i was just like oh he's big he could pick me up but like really they're not built for that like their 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 bone structure and their muscle structure is not built to carry that much mm -hmm. but when you're a kid you just see something big and you're like that's bigger than me therefore i could be eaten by it you know yeah that could eat me for sure um right. but it's just i mean you don't even have to be a kid to really uh exaggerate stuff because as we've seen oh, both in these american mythologies and from all the colonial people in africa if they see something that they don't immediately know what it is or understand it of course they're gonna be fanciful with it they're gonna say it was massive and it's this crazy creature that nobody's ever seen before probably has yeah, magical probably powers alien. yeah like you know they'll, they'll just make up all kinds of things because your adrenaline's pumping and yeah maybe you want to be more famous I, there were some mentions in the Mokeli and Bebe stuff that people who went and interviewed local people, uh, they pretty much only took stories from the people that said, yes, it exists, and here's what it looks like, and blah, blah, blah. And anybody that they interviewed that said they don't know anything about it or straight up that it doesn't exist, they just didn't include that. They just ignore it because they're like, well, that's not going to get the views. That's a bad data collection. Exactly. But, you know... I think that's what's the most fun because this is our first like cryptid episode. I can splurge a bit that like when it comes to these extreme exaggerations of these mystical creatures uh, from legends, mythologies or made up by artists that then people start thinking about and thinking maybe it is a thing um, is that like, there's probably some truth to it somewhere. Um, in that it could have just been a big vulture or it could have been a rhino but nobody had seen a rhino before or they or saw an elephant underwater an elephant underwater or some shadow in the woods that vaguely looks like this artist's oc that they saw one time <laughs> yeah I it was on Twitter. <laughs> it's like that's what's cool about it is like people are seeing things out in the world and they're kind of trying to figure it out what it is and maybe they're not as scientifically minded so they get a little crazy with the description but it's cool because there is something behind it and that's what i really enjoy about cryptozoology and cryptids is like there's definitely something to be found we just need to figure out what exactly it is but in the meantime at least it's fun to talk about how crazy it could be it definitely is. It's like ghost stories, but a little monster flare. Yeah. It's like something something physical, something you could go out and find. I'll find Siren Head one day. <laughs> one day. One day, my, one of my ventures with a megaphone into the forest will bear fruit. <laughs> I sure hope so. And until then, do you have anything else that you want to say before we sign off? No, I'm glad that we're doing this. Um, I love cryptos, cryptids and cryptozoology. Before I realized that it wasn't really a real career, I wanted to be one. Yeah, it's a huge bummer. I shouldn't say it's not a real career, but, like, you know. It's a hobby kind of thing. It's a hobby kind of thing, yeah. Like, there are some people who take it really seriously who have, like, their own personal museums, but there's no way that it's, like, a sustainable way for, like, science to advance. Oh, yeah. You're either a Maybe rich person. Maybe lucky enough, my primate studies will make me, will force me into an ex experience where i discover bigfoot is real but you know that would be awesome yeah if you want to be a cryptozoologist you either have to be super rich and have the time or be a proper researcher and then whenever a show like monster quest hits you up about something that's vaguely similar to what you study you're like oh heck yeah yeah usually it's a lot of 
anthropology because a lot of these cryptids are human based or humanoid creatures. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if we're talking about things like the Thunderbird, you would go to like an ornithologist for like a viewpoint on these shows about like, is this something that could feasibly exist? You know, where would it live? Blah, blah, blah. Um, that's the dream. But be one of those guys. I'm hoping I have, I'm taking a class next semester about all about cryptids. So I'm hoping that that'll give me even more knowledge that we can impart in this podcast, but I sure hope so. Yeah, I had a great time. Uh, and to everybody listening at home, if you have a specific cryptid that you want us to talk about, or a conspiracy in general, because I'm happy to keep this going for quite a while, let us know. I'm probably going to keep digging from Kevin's um, campaign and just using the creatures that show up in there, because you know a lot of times they just will get mentioned and we don't really get much lore out of it but there's lots of interesting lore and history with all kinds of cryptids and so i think we'll continue on with that for a bit but if you want other stuff you have suggestions please let us know in the comments and i hope you check out all the other series that we've mentioned throughout this episode big plug episode uh and other than that thanks for listening this is disney desk now